Okay. And thanks for inviting me virtually to give this, uh, this seminar. And as uh, Ifram was uh, saying before, I'm going to use this opportunity to present some of the main results I obtained during my PhD. And in particular, they are going to span through uh, two main topics. So one of them is going to be the topic of indefinite causality and the other one uh, of the one of indefinite thermodynamic error of time. Um, before starting, I am going to just uh, explain some of the motivation that, that uh, drove the, the sort of studies I did during my PhD and in particular the motivations also that are behind this full research line. Um, so one of the cornerstone of the scientific method is the study of causal relations. Um, so it's basically the study of uh, how observing one event that we call effect, we can relate it to another one preceding it, which we call cause. General relativity helped us to uh, refine our understanding of causal relations and when those causal relations can arise. And uh, in particular, for instance, thanks to uh, general relativity, we know that uh, when we call two events to be uh, space-like separated, then uh, they are uh, spatially too far apart for them to be any causal influence between one another. Whereas when we call them time-like separated, there could be a causal influence between one another. Um, so co the, the, the causal relation between events uh, depends also then on the, uh, basically the way in which we define uh, spatial distances and temporal durations. Uh, but in turn, we define spatial distances and temporal durations with respect to a so-called underlying metric structure. And the metric structure is affected by the presence of gravitational masses. So just to give you a pictorial example of in what way a metric structure could be affected by the presence of a gravitational mass, one could imagine this net as uh, this metric structure. And as you can see, for instance, in this, uh, in this picture, this would be undergoing a curvature around a gravitational mass. Um, now, this is the way in which, according to general relativity, we, uh, we describe causal relations. And this is the framework that we built within general relativity. However, it, it emerged more recently uh, that we may perhaps uh, need to, uh, to revise the, the way in which we treat um, causal relations if we want to build a theory that correctly encompasses both quantum mechanics and general relativity. Because, because a theory that encompasses correctly both uh, would actually need to uh, treat causal relations both as something dynamic because of general relativity, but also as something indefinite because of quantum mechanics. So what do I mean with this? In quantum mechanics, we know that uh, quantum observables may not always have well-defined values, be it because of a quantum superposition or perhaps because our quantum system is entangled with another quantum system. So for instance, in the case of the quantum superposition, one can explain it in terms of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, according to which uh, two or more observables in quantum mechanics, if they are conjugated, they cannot both have a well-defined value. So for instance, again, to give you a pictorial example, um, in this example of this particle here, one could imagine that the particle has a well-defined value in this diagonal basis zero plus one, and because of that, it cannot as well have a well-defined value in the so-called computational basis zero and one. And because of that, I showed it here as this uh, uh, being delocalized over two positions. Now, if in fact gravitational masses are uh, quantum mechanically uh, in superposition, uh, delocal hence delocalized in two positions, they may uh, affect the, the metrics around uh, differently depending on the specific position. And therefore, uh, one in a theory that tries to encompass both those aspects of quantum mechanics and general relativity, one might observe uh, some uh, quantum fluctuations in the metric. And so one of the challenges of building such a theory uh, was also how to formulate a theory which has a fluctuating causal structure. And so this was one of the main questions, which was at the basis of a, of a research field that arose about 10 years ago, and it's called indefinite causality. Um, so this was basically the, the, the beginning of my PhD. The, the, the field was, uh, was recently established, 
And, and about the, around the beginning of my PhD, it was soon realized that actually all those uh, concepts that were being built just in that period about indefinite causality for curved space-time could actually also be extended to the case of a flat uh, space-time. And this was interesting because it was paving the way toward the uh, application, the, the, the implementation of experiments on indefinite causality uh, in the lab with, with simple um, photonic setups. And so this is basically where my PhD started. And so today I'm going to present you just some uh, pieces of, uh, of the works I have, uh, I have uh, performed. And in particular, I'm going to present you two experimental works at first, which were two experimental demonstrations of indefinite causality. The first one through a so-called causal witness, uh, which I'm going to explain you soon what it is. And the second one was a, a so-called theory independent test, so beyond quantum mechanics, uh, of indefinite causality. And, um, and then instead, the last work I'm going to present, as I was anticipating uh, before, is going to uh, move a little bit, make a step more toward the field of quantum thermodynamics, and is going to discuss instead uh, superposition of thermodynamic times arrows, and it will be a, a, just a theoretical work, so no, no, no experiment uh, related to that. So let me start with the, with the first part. Um, so in order to make you understand what indefinite causality is in just a few slides, uh, let me start by considering uh, signaling correlations. So in standard quantum mechanics, we have that if uh, a well-defined order between the events is assumed, then if I have two events A and B, either A happens before B and so A can signal to B, or B can signal to A, or uh, the two are causal independent, so neither of the two can, can signal to one another. And one of the main questions, uh, very uh, loosely speaking, was whether one could find correlations which are incompatible uh, with any underlying causal structure. Um, now, because I was told uh, that, uh, that there will be both uh, students, but also uh, postdocs, professors, I tried to uh, present each topic um, with kind of uh, more different levels of uh, uh, details. And so I also now, I'm going to now explain basically the same thing also with a little bit more uh, formality. So basically the idea is that uh, we say that a signal can be sent from an event A to an event B when the probabilities for B's outcome uh, depend on A's measurement. So something like that, when I sum over all possible outcomes A of uh, the event A, uh, of this joint probability P of AB given XY, where uh, B are the outcomes of uh, the event B, X are the measurement choices of A, and Y are the measurement choices of B, I will have something of this form when there is a signaling uh, from the event A to the event B. So if there is a one-way signaling, then automatically this means that when I sum over all possible outcomes of B, there will not be any dependence of the outcomes of A from the measurement choices of, of B. Um, now, this is a situation where one has one-way signaling, and in general, we would call a definite causal order whatever is a convex mixture of those. So something like that, a convex mixture of uh, A signaling to B and B being able to signal to A. Whatever cannot be written in this form is what we usually call causally non-separable, causally indefinite. So lacking a well-defined causal order. Um, now, we, we know that, um, we do not know right now whether this um, indefinite causal orders can be found in nature in general. But we, do, uh, we did realize that actually quantum mechanics seems to allow uh, the existence of a weaker notion of indefinite causality. And this is what I'm going to present you uh, now in the next slides. So uh, one of the main examples of an indefinite causal structure that is done to explain uh, very easily what causality is, is the so-called quantum switch. Uh, in, in, in all what follows, I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to present only the case of uh, just two parties, but everything what I'm going to say actually can be applied also to more parties. And also, uh, as is customary in quantum information, I'm going to call these two parties uh, Alice and Bob. Now, 
suppose that these two parties are inside two so-called local laboratories. So they do not interact with the external world. They just interact with it through the state that they receive as an input and through the state that they emit as an output after they perform some operation on that. Now, suppose that I want them to act on the same quantum system. Now, clearly I will have to send it first to one of them and then to the other. Um, now, let us call this, uh, this quantum system uh, a target system, this one on which they, they both have to act. If I were to decide to whom I want to send it first, uh, classically, I could, for instance, flip a coin. Whenever I get heads, then I would say, send it to Alice first and then to Bob. And whenever I get tails, then I would, get it, I would send it first to Bob and then to Alice. If instead I want to decide who acts first and who acts second in a quantum manner, I could, for instance, use a two-level quantum system. And so I could encode uh, the, the order Alice before Bob in, say, the state zero of my system, and this, the case Bob before Alice in the state one. Let me call this quantum system control system, given that it controls the order between the operations. Then one could have that whenever the control system is in a quantum superposition of zero and one, uh, for instance, in a diagonal basis, then one could have um, a, a quantum superposition of Alice happening before and after Bob, um, performing an operation before and after Bob. Can, this I, is this can I already interrupt for a moment? Just because no one else is going to do it if I, if I don't jump in. And I feel like every time I hear you talk about these things, I have another really simple question that I should have already thought about. But if I understand what you're saying, the thing that you're trying to witness or, or, or detect, this, this indefinite causal order, you're really being specific to a quantum indeterminacy there. You're, you, you, the starting point is as though if I had a situation where there were two possible causal orders and I had to acknowledge that what I see is a probabilistic sum of the two, you're ready to say, well, that's not even so weird. I'm, I'm willing to accept that. I only want to know whether there's interference between the two. I'm mm -hmm. understanding that correctly. So the I thing that you're taking as normal is already strange in the everyday so world. So right? any, <laughs> any classical convex mixer between two, it's, it's fine for us. So whenever you flip a coin and, and one of the two comes first and the other comes second, it's fine for us. So anything that goes beyond that and cannot be written like that, it's going to be an indefinite causal order for us. And instead, whatever can be written in that form, even could be Alice happening before, or Bob happening before, or any classical convex mixer, it's a classical order for us. So a, a definite causal order for us. Thank you. And so, um, so just to finish what I was saying before, uh, I would basically create this quantum superposition between Alice happening before Bob, Bob happening before Alice. And then I will always have to uh, basically finish this, uh, this so-called quantum switch with an operation that I'm going to call C, just not to mix it with A and B. That will be an operation that uh, could be the analog of basically closing an interferometer. If you don't close an interferometer, you would get the which path information. And therefore, uh, you would know whether, for instance, if I cut it here, if it was coming from here or from there. So there will be a final operation C that is going to uh, basically uh, project on any diagonal basis, um, which is then not uh, zero and one. And so this is what we call quantum switch. Now, what is indefinite causality interested in? Uh, indefinite causality is interested in the so-called process. So the way in which the information is exchanged between the parties. So I don't... I don't really care what, uh, what Alice does and, Bob, and what Bob does inside their labs. And so I, I replace them here with some black boxes. They can do just whatever operation they like. And this is not something that concerns me. Um, if, I were, if I were performing now a quantum information protocol, most probably I would be interested in the, in the, in the target system, in the state of the target system. But right now, instead, I'm interested in, in these arrows, basically, sorry. In the, in the way in which the information is transmitted between the parties. So, uh, as I was saying just before in my previous slide to, to Ephraim, uh, one, basically this, this red arrow would be a so-called causally separable process, so a, a happening before B, or this yellow arrow, or uh, basically any convex mixture between the two. And whatever cannot be written in this form is a causally non-separable process. And in general, for instance, the 
process of the quantum switch is this thing that is inside this uh, yellow gray box. So the way in which the information is transmitted between the parties. Now, the, the, the first uh, step we wanted to do experimentally was to uh, build in a lab something that could be a quantum switch and, and prove experimentally that what we had built in a lab was indeed a quantum switch. So it was indeed a, a causally non-separable process. So how to do that, how to prove that what you have done is a causally non-separable process. The, 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 the technique that we used to, 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 for our first experiment was basically to use so-called causal witnesses. So for any of you who is familiar with entanglement witnesses, uh, it will be very easy to understand the concept of causal witnesses because it's very similar, just translated to the case of processes instead of states. So, uh, to explain you what a causal witness is, uh, basically, we, what, for instance, in this paper was proven, uh, that one of the first papers that introduced, in uh, that introduced causal witnesses, um, now the, the causally separable processes f form a closed convex set. So, if I have a closed convex set, according to the hyperplane theorem, it is always possible to find uh, given a closed convex set and the point outside the set, a hyperplane that separates the point from, from the closed convex set. So this, uh, if this closed convex set is the set of the causally separable processes, by definition, a causally non-separable process is going to be a point outside this set. And the hyperplane separating the two is a causal witness. So I, uh, basically what they proved is that just as in the case of uh, entanglement witnesses, um, they proved that for all causally separable processes, W sep, there exists an emission operator S, which is a causal witness, such that the trace of the causal witness and the uh, process of the causally separable process will give an outcome that is bigger or equal than zero. Therefore, if I calculate the trace, of their mission operator and my process, and I get a value that is smaller than zero, I will know that my process is a, a causally non-separable one. Um, so basically, this is the idea. This is the very basic idea, and this is what we, uh, what we used in the first experiment that I'm going to just show you now what we did. So one needs to know that the, one expects this state to be outside the, the set and to then evaluate the corresponding witness. In the case of the quantum switch, uh, we calculated the, the corresponding process uh, for the quantum switch, which can be written basically like this. So uh, there is this cat bra of this uh, switch vector, which, can, which is written in this form. Now here I use the, the double cat notation, which is simply like that. And I also uh, wrote it in the choya minkowski isomorphism, which for, for whoever of you isn't familiar with this isomorphism, this just describes the correspondence between quantum channels and quantum states. So uh, basically, this is uh, the, the, the state of the, the, the vector of the, the switch is just uh, of this form. So it's uh, the, basically the tensor product of uh, identity channels from, for instance, this first one is that whenever my control system is in the state zero, then I'm going to start, I'm going to have an identity channel that goes from uh, the, the, here this is past and future. So a, an identity channel that goes from past to input of Alice. Then this is outside my process, so nothing here. Then from the output of Alice to the input of Bob, and then an identity channel from the output of Bob to the global output. Instead, when it's one, it's going to be analogously following this yellow arrow. And so this is the process matrix of a quantum switch. Now, knowing this, we built a causal witness. So a causal witness is basically uh, described by a set of measurements uh, that Alice performs, that Bob performs, uh, the, the operation C that I was showing you at the end, and perhaps some preparation of the system, of this target system. And um, what we used was the knowledge that um, the probability of obtaining, uh, Alice obtains an outcome A, Bob obtains an outcome B, and perhaps the operation C obtains an outcome C, given measurement preparations X from Alice, Y from Bob, and Z from C, 
is given by this trace of the measurement of Ls, measurement of Bob, measurement of C, and the uh, process matrix, the W. Uh, so given that we knew this uh, expression from the process matrix formalism, uh, we could build a witness which is basically defined just by these measurements and by some real numbers alpha, which define a particular witness. So we, uh, what we did was basically we calculated these probabilities through uh, an, uh, a quantum opt optical experiment, uh, which I'm going to describe you now and whose setup is this one. So we, uh, we encoded, so we had two degrees of freedom to encode, right, to the, the, the control system and the target system. We used single photons, which are quantum light, and we encoded the target system in the polarization degree of freedom of the photons and the, uh, the, the control system in the, in the path degree of freedom of the photons. So we did a state preparation at first, which just involved some, um, some wave plates, a quarter and a half wave plate to prepare the polarization. Then our single photons were going through a beam splitter. The beam splitter would split uh, the photons either transmitted or reflected. This was a 50 50 beam splitter. Um, and then, depending on whether it's transmitted or reflected, it would either go through an operation MA first and then the operation MB, or the operation MB first and then the operation MA. And then it would be recombined, as I was saying before, in a final um, operation C and a final beam splitter that closes the interferometer and then measured. So basically, this is a max sender interferometer with, uh, with two loops, with loops. Um, now, for whoever of you is wondering what these operations MA and MB are doing, uh, in the very particular case of the witness we uh, calculated, uh, we performed a, a unitary operation in Bob with some um, quarter weight plate, half weight plate, quarter weight plate. And for the case of Alice, we performed something slightly more, uh, more complex. We performed a, a measurement and repreparation operation. Now, I should specify that this is still a unitary operation because the measurement I was performing, uh, there were, so I was performing the measurement as just standardly one would measure on polarization. So quarter weight plate, half weight plate, and polarizing beam splitter. But I did not have the detectors right away here. Otherwise, of course, I would, uh, I would get the which path information. I would erase the, um, the coherence between these two uh, paths. And so they would, I would uh, destroy the interference. So I was, uh, I was using this uh, measurement and then this repreparation without actually detecting the photon right away completing the, uh, the interferometer and then measure afterwards. And this was basically just a trick that allowed me to get, uh, to aim at a higher value of my witness. So I could have also done it just with, uh, for instance, two unitary operations, uh, but I decided to actually insert this uh, additional um, measurement inside just to get a better value, basically. Uh, this gave rise, of course, because you have that you either uh, project on H or V, this gave rise to an additional interferometer. Now, these were just some additional details for whoever of you was, was more interested about the, the setup, but uh, the, all these details are not necessarily needed to understand all what comes next. So uh, basically all what just you need to understand of this is that this setup enabled us to uh, evaluate a, a causal witness for this setup. This setup was um, um, an implementation of an optical quantum switch. And through this implementation, we obtained a value of the trace of SW equal to uh, minus 0 to, uh, 0 0.202 plus minus 0 0.029. So for about seven standard deviations, we showed that indeed we did have a value that is below zero. And so according to the causal witness, um, we had proven that the setup uh, in our lab was indeed exhibiting an indefinite causal order. And the results were published in this, in this work here. So this was a first, uh, a first demonstration of, um, of indefinite causality in, in, in the lab in a flat uh, space time. Now, for whoever of you perhaps got a little bit lost from the, the introduction, when in the introduction I was showing you this uh, gravitational mass and I was showing you this, uh, how the gravitational mass um, affects the, the curvature of the metric and so on, uh, one could feel like, okay, but how do this, all these um, 
conclusions about flat space-time relate to the case instead of, uh, of this uh, gravitational masses in quantum superposition and the uh, fluctuation of the metrics. So there is uh, a counterpart of a quantum switch also for the gravitational case, and this is the so-called uh, gravitational quantum switch. Now, just to give you a brief understanding of what a gravitational quantum switch is, imagine that we are we have very uh, very powerful experimental capabilities, and we can put a planet in a quantum superposition. Now. Suppose that Alice and Bob, the Alice and Bob I was showing you before, are still inside their local laboratories, but uh, say, for instance, that Alice is closer to one of the position of the, of the Earth, and Bob is closer to the other one, the other position of, the, of this planet in quantum superposition. Then, according to the, the position of the planet, either the uh, operation of Alice would happen before the operation of Bob, or vice versa, the operation of Bob would happen before the operation of Alice. Now, clearly this situation, this gravitational quantum switch, which is much more in line with what I was telling you at the very beginning, is not one-to-one -one with, the, with, the, with the example I was just showing you in the lab. Because uh, from the perspective of Alice, the operation that she performs would always happen at the same time. Whenever she looks at her clock, she's doing just one operation, and this would be this operation at time, uh, t, uh, at time for instance, T star for her. However, uh, from, and the same for Bob, of course. However, from the perspective of the particle that is sent, this target system that is sent to Ellis and then to Bob, there are still two different times. And this is the same also in the case of the setup I was showing you before. So whenever I'm, I'm inputting my single photons, they are splitted and the, the photon is, for instance, uh, transmitted to a first uh, operation from Ellis A at time T1 and then an operation of Bob at time T2. And vice versa, if it's reflected, the operation of Bob will be at time T1 and the one of Alice at time T2. So from the perspective of Alice and Bob, which are inside the lab, they can totally tell apart whether they are in a gravitational quantum switch or in a tabletop quantum switch, because uh, they would be able to say, oh, well, in this case, whenever I look at the clock, it's only always happening at the same time, whereas in the quantum switch, it's not in the, sorry, um, optical version of the quantum switch is not but for the perspective of the of the of the probe system of this target system sent to Ellis and then to Bob uh, the the situation is the same so basically the the idea is that the the gravitational quantum switch and the optical quantum switch are not the same thing uh, but the, the, the probe system that experiences a gravitational quantum switch or a quantum optical switch would, in both cases, experience a, a quantum superposition of causal orders. You, you actually confuse me again a little bit there. Every time you say this probe system that's sent to Alice and then to Bob, by the very fact of saying it that way, you seem to have imposed a, a causal order. So if this you know, photon line you've drawn on the left is sent to Alice and then to Bob, it just won't reach the event, uh, you know, in the, in the bottom plot where Bob's event came before Alice's. It'll reach Bob later. No, because, I, 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 because the planet is, so you see the planet here is closer to Bob. So in this branch of the quantum superposition, the event A happens before the event B because of the curvature of the, because this, the position of the gravitational mass makes a curvature in the matrix, whereas here, yeah really the time in which this uh, event occurs happens before the other time. And so in one branch of the superposition, these events will happen first. And in the other branch, this event will happen first. I, I agree if, if what we mean by events is, you know, those particular space time points, but it seems to me in the lower branch that let's say photon that you've drawn on the left, it can't travel backwards in time to reach that event at Bob. It, it would reach Bob at a later time. Wouldn't that event just not exist in that branch? It almost seems to me like you need some non-local probe to even talk about this. Now, maybe maybe my question isn't isn't clear. Um, I, I mean, I would. And I, I cheat and do the old Russian trick. I would say this photon would continue over here, mm -hmm. and you know it would it would never reach this lower T prime D event. Well, but in, that branch of, but in that branch of the superposition, so in that branch of the superposition, the planet would be in the other location. So 
so I perform this quantum superposition and in one branch of the superposition, so the, 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 here the control system is the planet. So depending on the position of the planet, I'm gonna then, uh, it's like in the same situation as the, in the previous one, the, the control system was, for instance, the path degree of freedom. Here, the control system is the planet. And so the, 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 the photon has to be linked to the, to the planet as a control. But then you're really saying that the photon travels backwards in time on, on this path in that, in that lower case with the planets on the left. No. That's the part that confuses me. No, because the, no, because the, yeah, I create the quantum superposition of the planet and this quantum superposition of the planet controls the quantum superposition of the photon. And so whenever the planet is in one position, I'm going to mm -hmm. send the photon correspondingly to the event that I, I know will be happening first according to this position. So I will send oh, okay. it. So it's the so this, this yellow line here is not the origin of the probe photon. I think that's no, 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 no. Sorry. No, no actually, this. Uh, no, no, no. One shouldn't look at this because this is. Uh, okay, this was. Uh, no, I just took this from from the from the article, but then this 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 line is actually something else. <laughs> sorry. No. So only one should only look at the these events and t. Sorry if, if this was confusing. Um, so okay so this was basically to just clarify a little bit the, dis the difference between the gravitational quantum switch and the tabletop so this was basically to clarify that they are not at all one to one and and, and it is not uh, meant to be claimed that they are one to one um and they are not even a simulation of one another i would really say that they are uh, two different processes and one can tell them apart but from the perspective of the, the single photon experiencing the two, basically in both cases, the single photon experiences a quantum superposition of causal orders. So now uh, let me go uh, back to the, uh, to the experimental case. So this tabletop uh, quantum optical experiments. And let me move to the second experiment I, want to, I wanted to present to you, um, which was basically um, something we devised to basically go beyond the first demonstration. In what way did we plan to go beyond? Now, the, the first demonstration is, was making use of a causal witness. Now, the causal witness is uh, a theory-dependent um, notion. Because as I was saying before, we, we make use of the, of the, of the uh, process matrix formalism and we describe the experiment within quantum mechanics. So if one were to use perhaps a different description, not a quantum mechanical description, one may perhaps get to potentially different conclusions. It, it is very important instead to uh, at least try to perform as much as possible theory independent demonstrations because one wants to prove that the, 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 um, that the property that one is looking at is not the particular feature of, of a theory that one has built, but is actually a property of nature. So this is somehow similar as uh, when one is trying to prove entanglement, violating a causal, uh, an, uh, sorry, um, violating an entanglement witness or violating a bell inequality. So if one is violating a bell inequality, it is a very strong, powerful tool because it's device independent, it's theory independent. And therefore, it enables us to draw conclusions about nature itself and not about just quantum theory. Whereas, for instance, a causal witness enables us to uh, perhaps, perhaps assess that our state is entangled, but it's very strongly dependent on the theory we made use of. So what we wanted to do was try to go beyond the first demonstration and try to prove that indefinite causality applies to, I mean, of course, the final goal would be really be to prove that this applies to nature. It's really a property of nature, but already it would be stronger to prove that it does not apply just to quantum mechanics. So perhaps that it applies to a broader class of theories. Now, one way to uh, prove that uh, that indefinite causality is a property of nature and not a property of a specific theory that one has built to describe it, would be to violate so-called uh, causal inequalities. Causal inequalities are bounds on correlations uh, which are respected by all causally separable processes. 
So if I have a process and this process violates a causal inequality, uh, this process must be causally uh, unordered, so must exhibit indefinite causality, but I, have, I would have proven indefinite causality in the strongest possible notion because it would be fully device independent, fully theory independent. Causal inequalities were built, but so far it is still an open question whether it is possible to find uh, processes, physical processes that are implementable in the lab and can violate causal inequalities. So basically the idea was, can we do something that is uh, stronger than uh, violation of a causal, the, sorry, not the violation, the, the measurement of a causal inequality, but even though this is weaker than a potential violation of, uh, of, of causal inequality. So stronger than a causal witness, but even if it's weaker than violating causal inequalities. And so this is the experiment I'm gonna present you now. And the idea was the following. Um, now, just to put this in the context of, as I was saying before, a little bit more formal, uh, the, what I proved before was that the, the process of uh, a quantum switch uh, cannot be written as a, a convex sum of uh, causally separable processes, so cannot be written in this form. Then, if one uses uh, the notion that that the notion I was telling you before, so that the probability of A, B, and C given X, Y, Z can be written in this form, this conclusion can also be translated into this conclusion. So that the probabilities themselves are, cannot be written as a convex sum. But if one doesn't do this assumption, so if one doesn't want to use this specific process matrix formalism, then one perhaps would not be able to draw the same conclusions. So this was just to explain you a little bit this notion of, um, going beyond the first demonstration, but in a little bit more formal mathematical way. So what we wanted to do was to try to provide some stronger demonstration than, than this. Um, so we did this uh, by making use of, the, of, a the, of a Bell theorem for temporal orders, which was proposed by uh, Magdalena Zick and co-authors. And some of these authors were also then authors of our, our uh, work. And the idea was basically to uh, to take the Bell theorem and to apply it to the case of, uh, of causal orders via a, a via no go theorem. So how does this work? The idea is the following. Uh, I'm gonna now present to you some, some assumptions and I'm gonna then tell you in the paper we also demonstrate this, that uh, if all these assumptions are verified, then one should not be able to violate a Bell inequality with the target system at the output. Then I will violate the Bell inequality with the target system at the output experimentally. And this will tell me that at least one of the assumptions must be wrong. And so I will then proceed uh, studying each of the assumptions. Now, uh, how, is this, how does this work? What are these assumptions? Okay, first, uh, of course, because I want to do a Bell test, I need more than, than one particle because I need to do the test, so I need at least two particles. And so uh, we had basically, for this experiment, two copies of a quantum switch. So the same, similar setup as the one I was showing you before, but two copies of that. So still a quantum optical setup, still same degrees of freedom involved, and so on, but two copies. Um, so the, the assumptions that we made for our, uh, for our no-go theorem, I should perhaps also specify that the original uh, proposal was proposed for gravitational masses, but we adapted it for the case of a, of a quantum optical experiment. So what I'm presenting to you now is our readaptation and it's not the original proposal. Uh, so according to our readaptation, the assumptions are the following. Assumption number one, the initial joint state of the two target system does not violate a Bell inequality. So it's a separable state to say it in quantum mechanical terms. Uh, the second assumption was that the two helices and the two bobs do not uh, perform entangling operations. So they do not perform something like a C naught. For instance, if this here, the two helices were perform a C naught together, then they would entangle, they would entangle the state. And so I would then be able to violate Bell. So my second assumption was that the laboratory operations uh, are not such operations, so are local transformations. And then the third final assumption was that the order between the operation is well-defined. 
If all these three assumptions are verified, one would perform a Bell test in these two labs, and one would not be able to violate a Bell inequality. Instead, we, uh, we injected uh, states that were in fact separable, and we performed this, uh, this test, and we observed the violation of Bell inequality. And so this told us that one of the assumptions had to be wrong. So just to explain you a little bit how it works, I'm going to uh, first describe how the thing works within quantum mechanics. So this next slide is not going to be theory independent, but I believe that this helps, uh, very often helps people to understand a little bit how this works. And then I'm going to back, go back beyond the, the, the quantum mechanical theory. So how does this work? Basically, what happens is an entanglement transfer between one degree of freedom and another. I'm going to transfer through an entangled quantum switch, so through these two quantum switches, the entanglement from the, the control system uh, to the order of the operations between the gates to the target system. So it worked in the following way. I, I inputted an, an initial state which was separable in the target, but entangled in the control. So something like this, 0, 0, minus 1, 1, so phi minus. Now, this control system uh, then caused the gates to be applied in this way. So whenever, just the same as before, whenever the state was zero, then I would have that Alice happens before Bob, both in one switch and in the other switch, switch one and switch two. Whenever instead the control system is one, I would have that, the, uh, that Bob performs its operation before Alice, okay? Like that. Then I would, as I was saying before, there would be the operation C. So I would uh, project in, for instance, plus minus. Any diagonal basis would work, also RL would work, for instance. And I'm gonna, for instance, have this, this outcome. Then I need to perform uh, a suitable choice of the operations of Ellis and Bob. Why? Because I want that, because both of them are gonna act on the same system, I want that whenever Alice happens first, whenever Alice acts before Bob, this is gonna give rise to a state, say, psi, that is orthogonal to the state that instead arises when Bob happens before Alice. This can be obtained, for instance, in, uh, with this particular choice of the operation. So whenever the two Alice's perform sigma z, and whenever the two Bob's perform identity plus i sigma x over square root of two, I have that if the operation a, uh, if Alice happens before Bob, then from zero, I go to a L, so a left-handed uh, circular polarization of light. Whereas, I mean, in the particular case of my implementation. And instead, whenever I have that Bob happened before Alice, so this operation was done before this one, from zero, I would go to a R, so right-handed polarization. So I would basically end up with, as you can see here, this phi minus state, in the polarization, so in the target. So I would have basically transferred entanglement from the uh, control system through to the order of the operation of the gates through the target system. So this is within quantum mechanics what happens and why it works. But now let's go again out of quantum mechanics. So this was just to make you understand a little bit why this works. And now let me show you the setup. As I was saying before, the setup is pretty much an extension of the setup I was showing you before. So it's two copies of that setup. Here I performed two unitaries. As you can see here, this is sigma uh, Z, and this was this identity plus I sigma X. Uh, some way plates, a quarter way plate and a half way plate, both at 45. And, uh, and these are the two inputs uh, for the, the, the control system. So I performed this experiment, and then here, and here I performed my Bell test on the target systems and I observed the violation of 2.55 plus minus 0 0.08. So for almost seven standard deviations, I observed that uh, there was indeed a violation of a Bell inequality. So this told me that at least one of the three assumptions had to be wrong. Also more of them could be wrong, but at least one has to be wrong. So now let's go to one by one and let's try to understand which one was wrong. Now, because as I was saying before, I want to do this beyond quantum mechanics, outside quantum mechanics, um, 
I, I'm not going to just do a tomography. Of course, we also did that. So there was also, as a test just for us, we also did quantum tomographies, for instance, and we saw that indeed the input state we were, we were inputting for target was separable. But I'm not going to present you those uh, parts now because uh, these parts were theory dependent. And I'm just going to present you the, the, the part of the proof which was uh, theory independent. So to perform it, uh, to check that the state is separable in a theory independent way, one can do the following. Um, if you have a bipartite system in a product state, then you have that for all local measurements, the probabilities for outcome pairs must be equal to the product of marginal probabilities of each subsystem. So basically, the joint probability P12 must be equal to the product of P1 times P2, where P1 and P2 are the marginalized probabilities. So what I did was the following. I performed all the measurements for the joint probabilities and for the marginal one and made the product of them. And then I checked the root mean square difference between the two sets of probabilities. And what I found was this value, this outcome, 0 0.6 plus minus uh, 2.7 uh, times 10 to the minus 2 for the case of assumption 1. So in this way, I proved that um, the state that I was inputting for the target system is indeed separable. And so I proved that assumption one holds. Assumption one is correct. And so the only two remaining possibilities are assumption two or assumption three or both. Now, proving assumption two was a little bit trickier because, because as I was showing you in the previous slide, um, the way in which this works is an entanglement transfer. So, so it's difficult to prove that the operations are non-entangling operations is if in fact they are performing an entanglement transfer because they are inserted in the switch. So what we did was the following thing. Uh, we separated the two cases in which assumption three was right and assumption three was wrong. So let us consider the case in which assumption three was right, and so that the order between the operations uh, is well defined. Now, if the order between the operations was well defined, then um, we what we did was basically I uh, in this in this setup here I removed uh, one of the two operations, for instance Bob, and I left only Alice, and I performed all possible measurement to see if only Alice would perform uh, would create an entanglement. And observe, I observe that it does not because this is just a wavelet and so there was no entanglement created uh, when Alice was the only one there. I also removed Alice, I had only Bob and I observed that also only Bob was, was not performing any, um, any entanglement, was not creating any entanglement in the target system. And so then we demonstrated in our, in our work that uh, no, order, no sequence, no classical sequence of non-entangling operation can give rise to an entangling operation. And so because of that, there is no possible solution that if assumption three was wrong, assumption two could be right. This would have been, for instance, the case of a C naught, but we proved that this was not the case in our setup. So we did not have a C naught. And so the only remaining possibility was that assumption three must be wrong. And so that the order between the operation must indeed be uh, indefinite. And, uh, and therefore, assumption three had to be wrong for sure. And then whether assumption three was wrong or not, we didn't really investigate because um, or what we wanted to prove was the assumption three was wrong. And this proves that the only possible solution of our, uh, of our no-go theorem was that, or the violation of our no-go theorem was that assumption three had to be wrong. And so basically this is how we proved in a uh, broader, with a broader validity. So not only for, for quantum theory, but for a much broader class of theories, so-called generalized probabilistic theories, we proved that uh, indefinite causality must be a feature at least of a much broader class of theories that can be used to describe nature. And so not only of quantum theory. And so, yeah, this was, a broader validity than just, for instance, the violation of uh, the, the measurement of the causal witness I was showing you in the previous slides. Now, 
basically with this, I conclude with uh, two of the experiments that I wanted to present you about indefinite causality. And I'm now gonna uh, just uh, move a little bit toward the most uh, recent uh, work I did during my PhD, which was as I was anticipating in the very beginning. Um, it's a just a theoretical work, so now no experiment is gonna be presented. And uh, it also does a little bit uh, a step away from indefinite causality and it actually enters into the field of quantum thermodynamics. Now, why, uh, how does this relate to the previous part and why do we involve now in uh, quantum thermodynamics? Often when I was uh, giving talks about indefinite causality, people would ask me whether this tells us anything about, uh, about the arrow of time if any conclusions, like according to these experiments that was presenting so far, does this tell us anything about, uh, about the arrow of time and uh, the, the way in which time flows? And the answer was no, because the, the time was always flowing in a well-defined direction uh, in all the experiments I was showing you uh, previously. So what we then started to naturally wonder was, what would we need to do to, to actually try to study superpositions of time's arrows? Now, in order to be able to speak about time's arrow, one need to uh, look at, um, at some phenomena that are uh, non-time symmetric. And one needs to uh, use a figure of merit that enables to define an arrow of time. And so this is why uh, quantum thermodynamics enters in the game because we decided to use as a figure of merit one of the most commonly used methods to uh, assess the time it's flowing and this is the second law of thermodynamics. So uh, the question that we posed ourselves was um, could we also then observe quantum superposition of uh, different uh, thermodynamic times arrows and how could, we, how could we tell that we are observing them? for instance. And so this is the answer that I'm going to tackle in these last few slides. Uh, this is just to give you, because I already explained you already two works, I didn't want to go too much in detail in this last part. And so I'm just going to give you a taste of what this uh, looks. And then, of course, if there are questions, I am happy to answer. So, so what does it mean to define an arrow of time? So I, I decided to explain you just with some videos what this means. Now, many physical phenomena are intrinsically time symmetric. So this means that they cannot be used to define an arrow of time. Why? Suppose that, that I had recorded this video with a camera and then I would perhaps flip a coin and depending on whether I get heads or tails, I would show you the movie either in the direction in which I recorded it or the time reversal of that. And then I ask you to tell me, am I showing you the movie in the direction in which I recorded it or the time reversal? Now, if the movie is this one, you wouldn't be able to tell me whether I recorded this one and this one is the time reversal or vice versa, I recorded this one and this one is the time reversal. Because this is perfectly time reversal of one another, so they could both occur with the same likelihood. They could not be used to assess an arrow of time. And now look at this movie instead. So suppose I recorded again, I recorded this phenomenon and then I would show you one of the two movies uh, in the direction in which I recorded it or the time reversal. And again, I ask you which one I'm showing you. Well, then if I'm showing you this one, you would say, okay, you are showing me the movie in the direction in which it occurred. And if you show you this one, you would say, ah, come on, you're showing me the time reversal movie. Of course, this is correct. And, uh, and well, it would be very difficult to guess wrong. The reason why it would be very difficult to guess wrong is thanks to the second law of thermodynamics. So in general, in the macroscopic world, uh, whenever uh, phenomena occur that are non-time symmetric, they uh, produce such a high amount of, uh, of entropy that observing the time reversal of that, of that phenomenon is basically, um, for all practical purposes, impossible. And so in the macroscopic world to observe this phenomenon would be basically impossible. 
Now, this is not the case instead for the microscopic world. So it was soon realized that the second law of thermodynamics actually is uh, uh, just a statistical law. So it is true on average, but not necessarily on the single experimental run in a microscop microscopic system. So just to put this into more mathematical form, as I was also doing in all my um, previous parts, um, one could say that the macroscopic case is uh, described by this theta step function, where here this is the likelihood of observing the, the forward process, so the, the movie as I recorded it, and this would be described by a, a theta step function that goes with the entropy production. Here, this is the dissipative work, but it's just basically the Boltzmann constant times the temperature times the entropy production. And so you would have that in the macroscopic case, uh, this is described by theta step function, whereas in the microscopic case, this is described by this function here. And so as you can see, um, people in quantum thermodynamics say that the uh, arrow of time is blurred because there are some uh, values, some regimes of entropy production for which it is, uh, it is possible to observe uh, both the forward or the time reversal process with just as likelihood. And so uh, basically this goes under the name of uh, fluctuation theorems and after we learned that um, these fluctuation theorems exist and so that uh, when, for instance, the entropy production is of the order of, uh, here I called it one, because I put uh, the Boltzmann constant and the temperature to one. Whenever this is of the order to one, then the directionality of the time flow cannot be inferred. And so both forward and backward could exist with equal probabilities. Um, instead, whenever, whenever the entropy production is much bigger, this is not the case. And so we recover the, the classical, situa the macroscopic situation. Um, we thought, okay, but then, so, so far everything was, was still classical, was quantum fl was fluctuation theorems, but in the classical case. And so we thought, if I could observe with just as likelihood a forward process or a time reversal process, could one also observe quantum superpositions among the two? And if, could I, for instance, be prevented from observing this? Because whenever I look at them, I project my system onto a well-defined temporal direction. Um, so this was basically the question at the, uh, behind our, our work. And I'm going to just now very briefly show you what was the idea, what we, uh, what we found. So before, before uh, going forward, I just want to tell you a little bit, what do I mean by superposing a forward and a backward process? Now, suppose that I have a gas, and this gas is inside a vessel, okay? And there is this piston here. Now, let me call, for instance, a forward process um, whenever the piston goes from halfway through to the, to the border, so to the outside. So whenever the piston is at the very uh, border of this vessel. Backward, vice versa, will be the piston moving in the opposite direction. Now, in this case, if I were to push the piston out, then the gas would be, at the beginning, it was in an equilibrium state, and then it would be naturally expanding and go to occupy the overall vessel. And so this would be the typical realization. Whereas instead, the time reversal movie, of course, would be the non-typical realization, the situation in which the gas just naturally from occupying the whole vessel occupies then half of the vessel on its own. Vice versa, if I were instead pushing the piston inside, because I'm still calling forward the case in which the piston goes from the middle to the, the border, the, the forward would be the less likely one because, um, well, because I'm actually pushing it toward the inside. And so the, as you can see, when I'm pushing it toward the inside, I would be basically with my piston hurting these uh, particles. And so this would be the typical realization and this would be the non-typical realization. So the most typical one would be the backward and the forward would be the, the non-typical one. This was for the macroscopic case. Instead, of course, when I have a microscopic case, for instance, I have powerless particles and stuff like that, then the fluctuation theorems tell us that, well, both forward and uh, backward processes are just as likely to occur in some certain entropy regimes. 
And so basically this was what we wanted to create. We wanted to create quantum superposition of forward and backward processes where here forward and backward were just labels, but still basically what we were superposing were two quenches that would be the time reversal of one another. So you can pick whichever you like as your forward one. Like here, I could have picked whoever I want, piston moving from, from middle to outside or vice versa. And, uh, and then we would be creating quantum superposition between two quenches, which are the time reversal of one another. And so uh, because they would produce two different entropy variations, I would create a quantum superposition of um, opposing time arrows in the thermodynamical sense. So to build this uh, framework, what we did was uh, we, we considered uh, a very similar case than what I was showing you in the previous slide when I was speaking about indefinite causality. So we are still going to make use of a sort of control system that controls, in the previous case, was controlling the order. Here it just controls the, the superposition between one time arrow and the, and the opposite time arrow. And so I'm going to have here now a thermodynamic system S an environment E, which includes the thermal reservoir and, the, and any other degree of freedom which might get entangled with my system, and then a control system C. And I'm going to then create an overall initial state of this form, uh, where here the tilde quantities are the one that we are, as a standard in uh, fluctuation theorems, the tilde quantities indicate the, the time reversal quantities. And um, and so this will be my uh, overall initial state. Whenever my control system is in the state zero, then I start from the initial state of the so-called forward process. And whenever it's one, I start from the, sorry, from the initial state <laughs> of the backward process. And, um, and then I'm going to uh, perform my quenches depending on uh, the initial state of my quantum superposition. So the, the basically the, the situation would be the following whenever the state is zero then i'm going to perform a forward quench uh, forward thermodynamic quench which could be anything which is described by this unit or u on the state size zero and whenever it's one i'm going to perform the time reversal of that quench on the state size zero tilde to study this sort of uh, quantum superpositions of time arrows we um we build a so-called uh, extended two-point measurement scheme. Um, for whoever of you is familiar with quantum thermodynamics and with uh, two-point measurement schemes, uh, the two-point measurement scheme is basically a method that is used to uh, reconstruct the uh, work probability distribution. And it's basically just something that performs a measurement of the energy of the system before and after the quench and reconstruct the, yeah, the work probability distribution according to that, repeating the, uh, the protocol many times. And so this was the original idea, this two-point measurement scheme. And what we did was we created an extension of that by creating this, uh, basically, a quantum superposition of these two quenches and performing measurements before and after the, the quench, and then measuring at the end. And uh, so basically we created quantum superposition among a forward and a time reversal quenches. And we studied this quantum superposition towards this extended two-point measurement scheme. And what we found is the following. We found that um, if we perform a measurement of the entropy production when the auxiliary system is, for example, uh, projected onto the state plus minus, we have that uh, our measurement, of, which was a measurement of the entropy, will actually effectively project my, my quantum superposition onto either the forward component or the backward component, depending on whether I get a, a very uh, large uh, value of entropy production with positive sign or with negative sign. So even though I did not measure the control system, if I were to measure the control system projecting, for instance, the control system in the state zero, then I would effectively project I would effectively project on this, for instance, upper component. And if I was instead uh, projecting it onto a one, I would effectively project it into this uh, time reversal component. But I'm not doing that. So I'm not measuring the control system. I'm just performing a measurement of the entropy production. And because of that, 
if I get a very large value, I effectively projected my state onto the either forward or time reversal component. So um, I would, this could perhaps prevent me from being able to understand it. I was watching, I was looking at a quantum superposition of times arrows. So how to tell instead that I was looking at the quantum superposition of times arrows? I can tell that I was looking at the quantum superposition whenever instead um, the range of entropy production is such that I can observe interference effects. So whenever uh, delta S is of the order of one, then the system uh, may ex exhibit interference. And this would allow me to understand that what I was looking at was a quantum superposition of a forward and time reversal process. Because, for instance, I would get some uh, work probability distribution which are uh, which do not have any classical counterpart, perhaps because, for instance, both the quenches that I was superposing uh, had some amount of reversibility, and and I would obtain because of uh, uh, constructive or destructive interference, I would perhaps envision a more or less reversible process than either of the uh, two. Uh, uh, quenches that I'm superposing. So this was basically the main result we obtained in this in this in this study, and uh, and this was really just this concludes this this kind of taste that I wanted to give you about this uh, superposition of times arrows, and this also brings me to the conclusion of the of the talk. Uh, so just to give you an idea of uh, basically how we uh, are gonna then move forward from here, um, I selected some kind of open question and interesting routes in both fields I was describing so far. So in the case of the field of indefinite quantum causality, uh, I believe that, well, one of the most important and interesting open questions is still the search for physical processes that can violate causal inequalities. Um, and then the perhaps from a, more, from a more experimental perspective, an interesting uh, route is instead perhaps to uh, perform some experiments of, uh, of indefinite causality of something that is not a quantum switch. Because so far, only quantum switches were experimentally implemented, all via quantum optical setups. Uh, they were implemented both for, uh, for two parties with many different degrees of freedom, so polarization path, orbital angular momentum, time beams, um, and also then uh, the quantum switch was also implemented for four parties, but it was a restricted form of a quantum switch. So uh, basically, if you have four parties, uh, all possible permutation would be four, four factorial permutations of these four parties. But actually what they did was only, was only four possible orders. And so they performed a, a quantum superposition of only four possible orders. And so a restricted form of a quantum switch, let's say. And so basically what would be interesting, I think it would be to experimentally perform something that also goes a little bit beyond the quantum switch. And instead from the perspective of the quantum thermodynamic error of time, um, I believe that would be interesting to, uh, well, certainly explore what scenarios may indeed enable the existence of this superposition of arrows of time in nature. Indeed, the, the setup I was showing you before would be kind of a, a building this in the lab and try to study those in the lab. And so it would be interesting to see whether there is any situation in nature that may enable that those sort of things actually arise. And, um, and then also another interesting question it would be that if there are such superposition in nature, whether just as I was showing you before that uh, our, our action of measurement was effectively projecting the system onto either of the two times arrows, whether perhaps in the case of nature, perhaps decoherence could uh, project those quantum superposition into a, a well-defined times arrow. And this is why it appears to us that we have a well-defined uh, times arrow actually in nature. And instead, perhaps there would be some superpositions that we just haven't observed so far. And so with this, I reached the conclusion of my talk and I thank you for your attention. And this is a list of the uh, references that were in my talk. Well, I want to thank you very much, Julia, for a fantastic talk. It's, it's always a pleasure and it always impresses me to hear work that combines such interesting experiments with theoretical work and really, I think, pioneering theoretical work at that. So with that, uh, there are a bunch of people still around and I hope that some of you have some questions. Floor is open. 
Hey, Julie, I have a question uh, concerning your experiment two and um, and how that test could apply to a physical, like, natural process. So, so, so this this sort of um, this, this sort of experiment kind of has a has an has an underlying um, like I guess like a hidden um, a causal causally ordered process that you could use to describe this, right? Like, so what I mean by that is if you, for example, um, switch your unitary um, AI A, or A one and A two. Uh, or A1, A2, B1, B2 to to be a, to be unitary that is say time dependent, then you would you would get like a different result, right? So, um, like, are, are there any is, is this test uh, applicable to like uh, determine whether like or to like rule out these this sort of underlying uh, hidden uh, like like hidden uh, underlying um, uh, causally definite uh, processes? So uh, there is actually a theoretical work that discusses exactly this question that you are asking right now. Uh, basically, this is a work from Ogni and Oreshkov, and it's it was published in Quantum, I think. I, I, I think in 2019, but could be 2020. But uh, if you are interested in this, I can search for this uh, reference and send it to you via email. Um, so basically, what Ognian showed in his work is that um, these operations, uh, in order to be able to perform quantum superposition of um, of time of uh, causal orders in a lab in a in a flat space time, uh, the operations must be uh, delocalized in time. So if you were to do uh, this, uh, this gravitational quantum switch, you would basically obtain that, they, that these operations uh, happen at the time in which Alice happens from the Alice perspective always at the same time. Whereas here, as I was saying before, they would happen at two different times, but yeah. this would still work because they are time delocalized uh, and they must be time delocalized, as you were correctly saying. Um, so if they are not time delocalized, this, then this would not, would not work. And so this is a necessary requirement for that. The operations inside um, um, a quantum switch in flat space time must be delocalized in time. And, uh, and so basically, yes, this is what we were saying is, is perfectly true and, and was studied in this work. And, and I think he, if you read that uh, publication, you're going to basically find exactly the sort of things that you were pointing at right now. I see. So I, I presume that you simply need to like, put in some, um, uh, I guess you call it um, like de delocalization time of, the, of, of, I guess, uh, the, all the unitaries. Uh, depending on your uh, your space-like separation between the between the different uh, parties, um, is that like the gist of it? So I didn't fully hear what you said. I think uh, basically the the idea is that they have to be time delocalized for a length that is such that uh, the time t one and the time t two should be both uh, falling under this uh, uh, time delocalization, and so they should not uh, change at a rate that is uh, so fast that the second that I'm T2 would basically uh, observe a different operation. This is the, uh, but I, yeah, okay. I, because I hear a noise uh, in the. Yeah, I think, I think my computer is like uh, putting the speech in there. So I, I apologize for that. But thanks, thanks for your explanation. I hope this answered the question anyway. Yeah, it is. Other questions? Um, maybe just to clarify, what was the thermalization role in few slides before? Yes, yes. So I didn't, I didn't explain this because, as I was saying, this is a very good question. Uh, I didn't explain this because I was just going a little bit uh, kind of quicker through, through this sure. last uh, work. So the idea is the following. Um, so these are unitary operations. So because it's a unitary operation, of course, by itself is reversible. So if I were to just do the unitary operation, I could just perfectly go uh, backward and, uh, and therefore uh, there would be no entropy production and there would be no uh, time asymmetry. And so it wouldn't make sense to be discussing superposing arrows of time because uh, this would be just perfectly reversible. And so it would be basically the, the example of, uh, that I was showing you in this video before in which I was saying here, it wouldn't make sense to speak about uh, uh, time's arrows. 
So if I were just to superpose two unitaries, uh, even if they are like the backward of one another, they, there would be a zero entropy production and therefore um, it wouldn't make sense to be discussing superposing errors of time. Uh, so the way that there are some standard ways to instead kind of put the time asymmetry by hand and the one that we chose in our work was to have a thermalization. So basically what would happen is that you start from an initial state, which is a thermal state. So it's a Gibbs state. And then you would perform your unitary. Your unitary brings your state from equilibrium to out of equilibrium. Up until here, everything would be perfectly reversible. Then what you do, you let the system thermalize. And the fact that the system thermalizes creates uh, a time asymmetry. And so because of this, you cannot simply just go back because there was this final thermalization that gives rise to a time asymmetry. Of course, I could have also just had them together. So I I'm doing the unitary and at the same time, there is also this thermalization. It's just that it would have made our calculations a little bit more complicated because I would have had um, both the work. Uh, so during my unitary, that would be both the work uh, or, or associated to this, uh, to this um, quench but also an exchange of heat with the environment. And so because of this, it would have been more tricky to single out the work and the, the, the heat exchanged. And so because of this, a standard technique is to kind of separate the two. And so usually you do first your quench when the system is isolated from the environment. So as I, as I was showing here, only the unitary and just the identity to the system. So I only do the unitary to my, uh, to my system and the environment is, is just, I, they are separated for now. And then I, recon I reconnect my system to the environment and I allow the heat exchange. In this way, basically the calculations are easier and one can separate the work and the heat. But through this trick, I, I ar arrive to um, a time asymmetry. And so I can speak about quantum, quantum superposing times arrows because the, uh, the entropy variation is, uh, uh, yeah, it's not zero. And so it, it basically enables me to speak about times arrows. So this, this was actually a very good point. And uh, uh, yeah, probably this was not clear in itself otherwise. Thank you. Is, so this, related, is this related to annealing? Simulated annealing? that is used in quantum computers as well. I, I wouldn't say that this is. Um, so I, I never thought about this question as a, as a quick answer, I would say no, I would not say that this is. Um, okay, but I have, yeah. Because I'm thinking about quantum computing and there they have the annealer, as you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I don't, un I don't understand why should this be related? I don't fully understand what would the link be, but... Well, they have unitaries. Uh, there is many connections, but we can leave it for now. Okay, I, yeah, I wouldn't say that these are linked, but perhaps there, somebody else would in fact see some link. I just haven't thought about it so far. Thank you. I have kind of a, a naive question about your interesting proposal or, or conjecture that decoherence might be related to the emergence of an arrow of time, which is to ask whether we even need that or whether it isn't just sufficient to say that in the real world, the entropy, the absolute value of the entropy is often much larger than one in your dimensionless units. And in cases where it isn't, maybe the real world simply doesn't have an arrow of time. Or, or is that actually what you're saying all along? Maybe, maybe that's the point. So, um, so, so there, so there are fluctuation theorems also in the classical case. So, as I was saying before, fluctuation theorems uh, are, yeah, as they were initially introduced, they are indeed classical. And so, in the language of, uh, in the language of fluctuation theorems, basically, uh, one says that well. Yes, when the entropy production is very large or very small, then yes, there is a well-defined arrow of time. And instead, the, when the entropy is, uh, is small, then very often the time directionality cannot be inferred. But the mm -hmm. idea is that there is still an underlying arrow of time, but it's, it's more tricky to infer it because of these uh, quantum fluctuations. And so basically what we did was just trying to insert in this picture the, the 
quantum superposition between those and try to perhaps think whether there could be then quantum superpositions of forward and backward and perhaps this could be what makes it so tricky to to see that there exists uh, so this was basically the original idea but then of course to bring it to the case like outside the lab and to the actual world and try to understand whether this conjecture is actually correct or not this is something that it's really material for future work and we haven't started investigating this question so it was more yeah for now it's more speculation than of course um, well if there's one last question we still have a little bit of time anyone have something they've been holding back uh, i've got a bit of a question if there's time for yeah that. i was expecting you patrick go ahead <laughs> yeah um so hi julia uh, hi really enjoyed the talk um i think this Thank whole you. program of research is really really exciting um it really puts a lot of foundational questions it, it brings them to bear on actual experimental procedures that we can carry out which is super super cool um, I also really like the uh, device independence aspect of this and the way that it allows you to kind of carve out sectors of this landscape of generalized probability theories mm -hmm. and the question I have is how this is sort of related to, uh, to there's sort of this promise of a relation to quantum gravity that seems to be going on in the background um, this is made explicit with that appeal to like, if you have superpositions of macroscopic massive objects like planets, then you've got superpositions of space-time structure and that's quantum gravity through and through. Um, and my question is, does this sort of, do these observations of, uh, in, of uh, indefinite causal order, do those hint towards the possibility of experimental evidence supporting theories of quantum gravity? Or perhaps do they actually uh, hint that other potential experimental tests, which might look like demonstrations of quantum gravity, may actually work even without quantum gravity? And so the, the reason I ask this is because all of your experiments were carried out in flat space time. So even with flat space time, so there seems to be no superposition of space time structure going on, you still get superpositions of causal order. And so I'm not entirely clear on how I'm supposed to read these results as telling me something about quantum gravity in the end. I, that wasn't a very well posed question, but I no, no, no. I think it was. I, I, I think it's very clear what uh, what you are asking. Um, so, so first I would like to say that. Uh, the, so the the short answer is no. So uh, this these experiments uh, will not uh, enable us to say whether one theory of gravity or another is correct or not because uh, in the, this is in the, the statement that um, a, a, a theory that tries to merge general relativity and quantum mechanics uh, may envision uh, fluctuations of the metric is actually a statement that is independent of the specific theory of quantum gravity that one looks at. So uh, this test could not be used to say, oh, okay, we go for loop gravity or anything like that. This is, this is beyond the, the scopes of indefinite causality. And, um, and also, it, I wouldn't know. The, also, this is the second part of the question, the answer is still no. So um, it's not that uh, if you just have uh, a flat uh, space time, you can just have all the conclusions that, uh, that of indefinite causality uh, without, um, without involving curvature of space time. Because, for instance, as I was showing you before, in the case of the gravitational switch, I was saying that uh, actually this uh, quantum superposition of gravitational masses. Um, does bring to some uh, conclusions, for instance, from the perspective of Alice and Bob, they can tell apart the two. So if I'm Alice, I, and, and you put me inside either this lab or this lab, I'm, if I'm here or I'm here, I can tell apart where I am. Because if I look at my clock here, I only do one measurement and this will always show the same time to me. Whereas if I'm here, I will see two different times in my clock. So Alice and Bob can tell apart this and that. And so the, the gravitational uh, situation and the flat space-time situation are not completely one-to-one -one and, um, and not all the conclusions that were, were, were drew about uh, indefinite causality can actually be uh, assessed by, 
uh, by the um, this tabletop experiments. And also, for instance, uh, as I was saying before, actually the, the, the biggest example of something that cannot be done with uh, these tabletop experiments that we're showing so far is uh, this violation of causal inequalities. So these causal inequalities were proposed and some processes that would be able to violate causal inequalities were found and the polytop was fully characterized and so on. So we understand this concept very well. Uh, but we haven't found yet some processes that are physical processes and that could actually, uh, in a lab, violate causal inequalities. We know that the quantum switch does not violate, and we know that also anything what is slightly more complex than the quantum switch would still not violate. By slightly more complex, I mean that uh, basically here, when I was showing you this process, I was showing that there is this control system and the control system decides whether Alice happens before Bob or Bob happens before Alice. Now, this I was showing you for the case of two parties. I was saying we can extend it to more parties, but even more complex thing can be done like quantum controlling uh, the order within more complex ways. But basically, like uh, a few weeks ago, it was proven that any of those, so wh whenever I will have a process, that is created, whose uh, indefinite causality is created with, with a uh, quantum control system, a control system, uh, this will not violate uh, causal inequalities. So there are still things, for instance, that, uh, well, we are still wondering how they, they can be done, and these are still open questions that go beyond the sort of experiments that we can do now. So, so the experiment that we can do now cannot really answer all the questions that we have in you know an indefinite causality and they are certainly an interesting way to probe the theory but uh, but there are aspects of the theory that go beyond these experiments and it does very interesting aspect to investigate in the future very cool that's awesome thanks well, with that i i think it's time for us just to thank julia again for a wonderful talk and for answering all those questions and uh, thank you for having me forward to some more uh, direct conversations this coming monday yes. uh, and just Congratulations one more time on your PhD and good luck with these next steps. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you very much. And thanks once again for giving me this opportunity. It's great having you.